Yeah, so I'm Patrick. Um, title of our paper is Incremental Packrat Parsing. This is joint work with my colleague Alex Worth from Y Combinator Research. So just as a bit of background and motivation for this, so Alex and I and some other folks on our team built a tool called Ohm. So Ohm is a peg-based parser generator, basically a meta language and a library for creating packrat parsers. And we're kind of big fans of live programming. So this idea that um, in your editor or your IDE, that as you're programming, um, you're seeing instantaneous feedback to the things that you type. And this, of course, requires your parser to be pretty quick. Um, Packrat parsers often aren't that fast, and this can actually be a bottleneck to um, instantaneous response times if the source code is large enough. So just a quick overview of what I want to address. I want to give uh, an introduction to Packrat parsing for anyone who's not familiar with it, because it's uh, essential to understanding our algorithm for incremental Packrat parsing. Uh, then I want to talk about our algorithm specifically, which is, as far as we know, the first published algorithm for incremental packrat parsing. I'm going to talk about the performance, um, which is the main, our main consideration for this, and touch briefly on future work that we'd like to address. So let's talk about packrat parsing. Um, we already talked about it a little bit before in the previous session. A packrat parser is basically a backtracking recursive descent parser with one really key difference, which is that packrat parsers uh, basically memoize all of their intermediate results, and this allows them to guarantee linear response times. Uh, sorry, linear, linear parse times. So let's talk about a specific example. We'll use the classic um, arithmetic grammar. This is a really rudimentary language that only supports addition and subtraction expressions. So a number plus a number or a number minus a number. And I want to talk about how um, it, a packrat parser will go about parsing the input 896 minus 7. So the key data structure of packrat parsing is something that we call the memo table. You can think of this as basically a big matrix. So you have one column for every input position, actually one more column than you have input positions, typically. And you have a row for every rule in your grammar. Um, now if we want to parse an arithmetic expression here, uh, so packrat pack parsing is a top-down um, parsing algorithm. So we begin by looking at expression. We take the first choice of expression, which says we're going to try and match this um, addition expression. So we'll try to match a num. A num is a sequence of one or more digits. And a digit, of course, is any character between 0 and 9. Uh, we have an 8 there, so digit succeeds at position 0. And so in a packrat parser, any time a rule succeeds, you record that success. Actually, any time you evaluate a rule, you record the success or failure in this memo table. Uh, we want to match as many digits as possible, so we're going to move the position ahead to one, uh, attempt to match another digit there, which succeeds. We match a third digit. Finally, at position three, we will fail to match a digit. All of these successes and failures are recorded in the memo table. Uh, this means that our num succeeded and consumed uh, three characters. So just to talk a bit more about sort of the, what you actually typically store in the memo table here, it's not just success or failure. You need to, um, you do something typically like this. You record, say, the next pause after this succeeds is position three. And you also need to record, you know, a, a parse tree or something like this. So let's go back to our parsing ex, uh, to expression here. So we succeeded in matching num. Uh, we're going to try to match a plus. This will fail because we have a minus character there, right? Which means this entire, entire alternative fails. We're going to backtrack to position zero and start matching the second alternative. Um, so this is where a packrat parser really differs from a conventional backtracking parser. Um, in a regular backtracking recursive descent parser, you would now end up duplicating work that you've already done here, right? We already attempted to match a num at position zero. Um, we matched all these digits. 
In a packer parser, we don't need to redo this work. What we do is every time you evaluate a rule, you look in the memo table to see if you've already evaluated that rule at that input position. In this case, we have position zero. We know that num succeeds and that it consumes three characters. So we just update the position to three and continue parsing. We'll parse the minus. Um, we want to parse another num, which is a digit, and then a failed application of digit. None succeeds, and finally, we succeed in parsing the arithmetic expression, and this consumes the whole input. So that is a brief introduction to packwrap parsing. Um, now I want to talk about our algorithm for making an incremental parser from a regular packwrap parser. And when I do that, I'm going to use a slightly different representation of the memo table than we used before. And you'll see why I'm using this in a minute. Um, so what I have here, the gray boxes represent things that succeeded, things that were green check marks in the previous representation. Um, but the amount of input that they consumed is represented by the width of the box. And we have some failed entries like uh, the digit here, a position three and a position five with an X beside them. They have no gray box, they did not consume any input. So the core of, um, well actually I should say first, <clears throat> an, an, an important part of increment, or of, of pack wrap parsing in general, is that these memo table entries do not depend in any way on the state of the parser. So it doesn't matter where these digits were invoked from, um, if you have an entry at, you know, these, this, these, we have these three successful digits at position zero, one, and two, no matter what the state of the parser, that means that the digit rule will always succeed at that position. And so this naturally means that it's, it's already, you can see it's maybe conceivable that we could keep some of these entries around and reuse them on uh, uh, the following parse and get our incremental parsing. And so it turns out the crux of this problem is essentially that we want to figure out how much of the memo table we can, we can keep around and how much we need to modify. And uh, then we want to reuse as much of it as possible. So the two properties we're looking for is we need to make sure that every entry after, we, um, after you make a change to the input and you modify the memo table, you need to make sure that every entry is consistent with a from scratch parse. This is because, you know, the correctness condition for an incremental parser is pretty simple, that an incremental parse should always produce the same result as parsing from scratch. And finally, we obviously want to maintain as much of the memo table as possible. We can trivially satisfy the first property by throwing everything away. Um, and, and we won't get any benefit from uh, the work that we've already done. So, Let's talk about how you actually figure out what entries you can keep and what entries you need to modify. So this is the parse table, uh, this is the memo table that we had before for the same input. Let's assume we have an edit at position one here and we want to replace the character nine with the letter Y. And we need to remove, our first step is we want to remove any entries that um, would now be inconsistent with parts, parsing from scratch. And the simplest thing we can do is what we call the overlap rule. And that is that any, um, any memo table entry who's, who consumed the characters that changed, uh, this stuff clearly is neat, we need to reevaluate, right? We, we no longer have a digit in position one, so that we, we can see that that will now fail. Um, that means that our num will no longer con consume the first three characters and the expression may or may not consume uh, the, the entire input now. So the simplest thing we can do is to just uh, go ahead and delete those entries from the memo table. And then uh, we'll parse again with the modified input and that will result in some new entries being added to the memo table. And these ones are shown in blue, right? So we want to make sure that this whole thing looks like it is consistent with a from scratch parse. So we now have the digit, a uh, failed digit entry up here in position one, right? Because Y is not a digit. This means that our num now only uh, consumes one character. 
and we actually failed to parse the expression now. This is not a valid arithmetic expression. So let's go back to the uh, original memo table that we had. I want to show an example where this simple overlap rule is not sufficient for, um, for detecting entries that have changed. So if we have an edit at position three, and um, say we want to replace the minus character with a five. Now if we do the simple overlap thing, we blow away those two entries, the failed digit and the expression. Um, but you may notice something here, which is that if we parse from scratch, a num would actually consume all five characters now, right? This is a number. But we did not detect any overlap here. Um, so using our simple rule, we, we would not detect that num needs to be invalidated. So to solve this problem, we introduced something that we call the maximum examined position. And the idea behind this is you don't need to just look at um, input that was consumed by a rule. You also need to care about input that where the, the, the value of the input affected the parse, a parsing decision made by that rule. Um, so let's just concentrate on the num and our four digits here. So <clears throat> let's talk about what it means to examine an input position. So I'm going to represent uh, examined characters using this little black underline. So in the first three successful applications of digit, we know that they have to examine the input at that position, right? You have to look and see whether you have a digit there, and that constitutes examining the input. Uh, the failed application of digit also has to examine the input, even though it never consumed that, right? You it depends on the value there. And then we define, we, we basically say that <clears throat> When one application depends on another application, so in the case of num here, um, the amount of input consumed by num depends directly on these digit rules, right? If we don't have a failure here, if this is actually successful, then num would consume more input. And so that means that num's uh, examined interval needs to cover the examined interval of all these rules that it depends on. And uh, so we, if we draw the, the minimal interval that, that, that covers all four of those intervals, that's what we have. So num actually examines the character in position three, um, even though it doesn't consume it. Here's the rest of our examined intervals for, for these entries. They don't really affect this edit, but... Um, so now if we go back to this edit that we made and we do the overlap rule, we'll see that uh, not only does this failed digit and the expression uh, overlap with the edit, but so does the num rule, so we also remove that from the memo table. And then if we parse, do our incremental parse, we will get a correct result this time. <clears throat> so that's, that's sort of the final overlap rule that we apply. Uh, if we look to the, the memo table entries that are on the left of this edit, uh, the edited interval, um, because there are, we, we know that they didn't examine any of the input that changed, um, so they can just remain as is, right? We, it's safe to keep these around. If we look at the stuff to the right of the edited interval, we also know that these didn't examine the input because there's no such thing as look behind. Um, <clears throat> however, we've only talked so far about replacement of input characters, right? But the, the length of the input remained the same. So what if the length of the input changes? What if you have a deletion or insertion? Uh, remember before I said that quite often we have these, these absolute positions that are stored in the memo table entry. So we might have for this entry, next pause, five, right? And this is referring to an absolute position uh, in column five here. And we had the max examine pause, which I said we needed to introduce as well, right? So the solution for this is pretty easy. We just use relative uh, positions here. So we call these match length and examined length. And what this, what this allows is that when we have addition or deletion, or sorry, insertion or deletion, we can shift these memo table entries around very, very easily. Um, so we don't need to go and visit every single memo table entry that comes after the edit 
and update their absolute positions. Um, we can basically, in a constant time or, or low linear time, um, update those, just move, shift those columns around. So that is basically the core of our incremental pack wrap parsing algorithm. Um, paper goes into a little bit more detail on some optimizations that are necessary to make this really uh, perform well. But so I want to talk a little bit more about the performance characteristics of this. So our main evaluation that's discussed in the paper is um, what I decided to do is to actually record my own keystrokes in the editor as I typed out a patch for our for Ohm, our um, our open source project. And what we did, our benchmark was to essentially uh, figure out what the parse times are if we wanted to update, if we wanted to reparse on every keystroke, essentially. And uh, this was all in JavaScript, so we built two JavaScript parsers, packwrap parsers. One is just kind of a very simple, naive um, packwrap parser, and the second one is an incremental one based on our algorithm. Uh, they share most of the same implementation. So the incremental one is just basically a, uh, uh, inherits from the standard one. And so the parse times uh, in our in our evaluation for the stand, for our standard parser. Uh, now this is this is a, quite a large source file. Like we're really testing uh, the limits here. This was I think around close to 300 kilobytes. So it's uh, you know not a whole lot of source files are that big, but a sort of naively implemented packwrap parser, you're looking at about 1.6 seconds, uh, at least that was the time for, for our parser. And this is obviously not acceptable if you want to provide instant feedback um, whenever the programmer changes the source code. Our incremental parser, because you know on the first parse you don't have any um, anything in your memo table, it's pretty much just as slow, although oddly enough it was slightly faster. Um, 1.5 seconds for the initial parse, but afterwards we see parse times around, the median parse time was about, was 4.7 milliseconds. Um, so this was, this was actually really surpri almost surprisingly good to us, um, and we were very happy with this. You also see some, some spikes here um, that are related to garbage collection. I go into details in the paper about where these come from, but it's basically times when the incremental marking uh, of the garbage collector is active. To put this in context of a non pack wrap parser and a non incremental parser, there's a parser called Acorn, which is a really fast, mostly predictive uh, parser, you know, hand optimized uh, JavaScript parser, and their parse times are closer to 23 milliseconds. So it's, you know, maybe not super surprising because an incremental parser you would hope is going to be faster than, uh, than a non-incremental parser. But still, this for us was a, a really nice result that we can actually beat a hand-optimized parser. And the cost for this, so, so there, you do pay a little bit of a price in our implementation and memory usage. We have to maintain, we, we use extra memory to maintain this uh, examined interval for every entry. Um, we parse a bunch of sort of popular JavaScript libraries to try to get a sense of, of what this looks like for JavaScript anyways. And uh, you, the, the extra memory cost is about 11%. Uh, so for us, we think this is an acceptable trade-off in uh, memory for uh, much better response times from the parser. So future work that we'd like to address with this Number one is we, we want to fix this problem of, you know, the 1.5 second initial parse. Um, luckily, there's a lot of research in um, pack wrap parsing that shows how you can really bring down these parse times. And most of these optimizations are compatible with our algorithm. Although there is some trade-off that if you memoize less in your initial parse, it will make your incremental parses slightly uh, slower. And the second thing is that we'd like to try to address incremental semantics. So Ohm has this sort of nice uh, modular design for its semantic actions, and we believe it's possible to do incremental semantics uh, in, uh, combined with incremental parsing. So right on the 20 minute mark, I think I will say thank you. Um, if you have, if you'd like to see, 
learn more about this stuff, go to uh, the homepage for our, our library ohm, ohmlang.github.io, there's the full paper, links to all the source code, the artifacts, um, and in the paper, a lot of the source code is actually in the last two pages of the paper. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'm happy now to take questions or find me later today too. Thanks.